whatever like there's all these rules and it's like according to who whose rules are these do they even work for you um and so i really encourage people to do what you want right like if you want to have sex the first night then freaking have sex the first night if you want to wait till marriage wait till marriage if you want something in between in between is fine um if you want to share how you feel if you want a second date if you want to tell someone you like them if you want someone to call you instead of text freaking do it This is episode number 512 with Veronica Grant. You are meant for love. We're going to be talking about her book, You Are Meant for Love, and her journey to find the love of her life and the obstacles that she had to go through to get there. There's a lot to be learned from her story, and I can't wait to share it with you. But first, let me say hi, I'm Sandy Weiner, and welcome back to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late to go on your last first date. And to support you on your journey to lasting love, I wrote a book called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. And it's really not just for single women, it's for any woman who wants to be empowered It has 30 chapters divided into three pillars of core confidence. Show up, stand up, and speak up are the three pillars. And uh, every week I share a tip from the book. And this week's tip is step number 13, do not settle, which is really, you know, these kind of come up randomly, but it really is appropriate for today's podcast because Veronica's journey is really about not settling. I think we often get confused about when are we too picky and when are we not picky enough? When do we settle? When is it considered settling? And I I just want to sort of share my two cents on that. And I think that when you're settling, you're really not fulfilling the the must-haves that you must have in a relationship. Or maybe there's a deal breaker, which makes the must-haves null and void because one deal breaker is all it takes. And so I'm just going to encourage you this week to look at where you might be settling, whether it's a job or a romantic partner, or even a friendship, whether you're settling and suppressing who you are in order to be with this person. And so take one baby step towards not settling. And I know that your life will improve. Before I bring Veronica on, I would invite you to join our Facebook group. It's called Your Last First Date. And we are a group that supports women over 40 to have the love that they want, the love they deserve. And we do that by having seven monitors who monitor the group. There's a monitor for every day of the week. There are thoughtful posts. There is encouragement to be kind, to communicate better, to do all the things that lead you to your last first date. And now for my guest, Veronica Grant. She is a love and life coach and the author of You Are Meant for Love. And if you're watching this on YouTube, here's a copy of her book. It's a really lovely book. And she's the host of the Love Life Connection podcast. She helps successful women who have it all except love find it. And she's been featured in many, many publications and podcasts, including <laughs> oh, the Oprah magazine, Bustle, Your Tango, Cosmo, and many more. As somebody who struggled in love and was tired of the unsolicited and patronizing advice, and I think many of us can relate to that, she created the resources that she wished she had before meeting the love of her life, her husband. Welcome to the show, Veronica. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So tell us your story. I know that's kind of a uh, a long-ish story <laughs> about how you found love, but I loved really reading about the, the steps you took and the people you met along the way. To really sum up my love life when I was younger, it's really a story that is intertwined with my relationship with my body and really just how I got a sense of worthiness, self-esteem, feeling loved, feeling like I belonged. I grew up in a family where our bodies were very, you know, and how they looked was top of mind. And, you know, from the women in my community or in my, in my family. So my mom was always trying to lose weight. My Nana was always trying to lose weight. My grandma was always trying to lose weight. They were constantly commenting on other women's bodies, like celebrities, their own, each other's, and also mine. And so whenever I you know, heard something along the lines of like, oh, you put on some weight or you've gained some weight. Obviously that felt pretty crappy. And then I would 
have times where I, you know, at this, you know, I was really young. I wasn't trying, but I might've just looked skinny because of what I was wearing, or maybe I really had lost some weight or whatever. Either way, I would get compliments or <clears throat> comments like, oh, you're, you're looking thinner, you're looking good or whatever. And, you know, that felt really good, right? I mean, it's a compliment and it's, you know, about how I look, which whether we like it or not, that's the society that we live in. And so that's where I was getting a lot of my confidence from and it felt good. And so I wanted to keep feeling like that. And so it wasn't just my body. It was also grades and, you know, who my friends were, like if I was with the cool kids or not the cool kids, my clothes, like if I had cool clothes, like limited to was really cool back in the day. Um, and this really just created a story in my head that all of these external things that I could get could make me feel good enough could make me feel worthy, could make me feel that self-esteem, that sense of love, that sense of belonging, that sense of really safety that I think everybody wants to feel. And um, I think looking back through, you know, my doing all this work on myself and therapy and coaching and blah, blah, blah. What I discovered was that that pattern transferred over to my love life when I became, you know, a teenager and then into adulthood. And basically what that was, was that if someone liked me, then I was on top of the world and everything was amazing and I could conquer all. Um, and if someone didn't like me back, then my world just like fell apart. And it was hard for me to even get out of bed to do the things that I needed to do to go to work or grad school at the time or whatever. Um, and this was really the story of my love life over and over and over again. I mean, I could talk about a bazillion relationships that this happened in or a bazillion, you know, non-starter relationships and everyone really got to the official re relationship status. Um, but it was, it was just the only way that I knew how to source my confidence and worthiness. Um, you know, and I wasn't able to do that from within. And I think also what was going on is because I learned to source my worthiness and all of that kind of stuff from the outside, I actually lacked a deeper emotional relationship with myself. And this actually made me not emotionally available for the relationship that I thought I wanted. And I think a lot of women, especially get confused with this, um, wanting a relationship, even deeply desiring a relationship is certainly not the same thing as being emotionally available for it. And so in the book, I make a joke kind of throughout the book that, um, I'm, like the How I Met Your Mother main character, Ted Mosby, who just always wanted to meet his soulmate from a very young age. And I was very much like that as well. And so I spent a good part of um, my, you know, good part of my dating life thinking like, why is everyone else able to find a relationship? My best friend at the time, well, she's not my best friend actually, but my best friend at the time, she, um, she didn't even really want a relationship and she was finding her husband and she met, or the, the person she ended up marrying. And I was just like, WTF, like <laughs> she doesn't even want to get married and I want to get married and I can't find anybody. Um, and so, um, so sourcing my, my validation, worthiness, all that kind of stuff from outside, just help, help to create this pattern within myself where I just lacked an emotional relationship and a, a deep emotional, um, or a deep relationship with myself. And I just had trouble then connecting with others in that way, especially in the space of romantic relationships, because there is that added layer of vulnerability and potential rejection that I think is different in, um, in more platonic kind of friendships. And so that being my kind of where I was coming from and my come from in my dating life, it created two main patterns. So one is like, the emotionally unavailable guy and like kind of the anxious attachment, like, please validate me, please text me, please plan something where we can hang out or whatever. Again, all of that would make me feel good if we had those things on the books. Um, the other pattern that I found myself in, and I talked about one of the most significant of this um, relationship in, in the book, and that is I would actually attract somebody who was everything that I wanted. Um, and the relationship I referred to in the book was my college boyfriend he was, um, I mean, he really is an amazing guy and he was totally in love with me, very deep, very emotionally available. And I just, you know, I think in the end, I didn't really love him the way I wanted to love my future partner, but also I was, it was very clear to me now that I was not emotionally available for him. It just felt like the relationship just felt really oh, like kind of just made my insides clamp up because it was so weird 
and uncomfortable and unfamiliar for someone to see me in that way and love me for who I am versus like my boobs, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, or whatever, you know, that relationship ended. I had a few other crappy relationships and I won't get into all of it, all the details right now, but ultimately what happened is I, uh, in 2012, I joined the Obama campaign as a paid staffer. And if you've ever worked on a, on a political campaign, especially a presidential one, the hours are in freaking sane. They're insane. They're, um, you're working probably seven, 8 AM until nine, 10 o'clock at night, six days a week. And then you get Sunday mornings off, except for like the last month or two, that doesn't count anymore. But so I joined the campaign. And when I was on the campaign, I had no time to diet. Um, because I, I was always counting calories and kind of figuring out, okay, do I need to like go on a run so I can eat dinner later or so I can have a glass of wine? Like I had this really unhealthy relationship with food and counting in my body and exercise and everything. And on the campaign, I just didn't have time to do that. And because it was insane hours, obviously I was fatigued and exhausted and just everything. And I remember after the campaign ended, so after the election thinking, okay, I'm so tired. I just need a weekend to sleep and then I'm going to feel normal again. And I also didn't have a job because the campaign ended. So I was at my mom's house and I was laying on the couch, just so exhausted. It was like two weeks after. So it was like almost Thanksgiving. I'm like, why am I still feeling like this? I haven't recovered yet. And I've been doing nothing but laying on the couch. So I still had it mustered up the energy to start counting and getting quote unquote back on the wagon. And at the same time, this is when Instagram was beginning to get big, especially as it related to taking pictures of your food that you're about to eat. And, um, I was uh, following one of my friends who was a vegan and she blogged about it and she just had this amazing relationship with her food. She was talking about her food. She was excited for what she was going to make. She loved taking things that was like, I don't know, like spaghetti and meatballs and Parmesan and like veganizing it. Um, and I just thought like, I want to relate to my food like that. I'm exhausted. I can't go back to how it was before because it's just so energetically, emotionally draining to be counting and dieting and trying to lose weight all the time. And so, um, and so in my head, I thought instead of just choosing to relate to food like that, I was like, okay, I guess I must be a vegan. And then I can re relate to food the way she relates to food. And so that's what I did. I became a vegan and, um, food really did actually become super fun for me. I was enjoying reading all these vegan blogs and I bought some vegan cookbooks and I like to veganize things like, you know, macaroni and hot dogs or whatever. Um, it was just super fun. I felt great. Cause I was eating, you know, naturally a lot of vegetables and fruits and you know, grains and things like that. Um, and it was the first time ever that food was just, um, fun and nourishing and energizing. And at the same time, um, you know, eventually I moved to DC and, you know, with my new job, I was still a vegan, still really loving this, you know, I love food kind of lifestyle. And I also decided to, um, get my yoga teacher certification. And so, through that process, you're, you know, if you ever do a teacher certification, most programs will probably make you develop your own practice around like your morning routines with breath work and meditation and journaling and introspection and all that kind of stuff. So it was kind of coupled between those two things, radically transforming my relationship to food and therefore not getting the sense of validation or worthiness from my body or whatever, and also deepening this relationship with myself that I accidentally healed the relationships I was attracting in my love life. <laughs> mm. um, and, and that's because it's really was just about the relationship with me and where I was sourcing my joy and my worthiness and my sense of self and sense of love from. And it was really coming from within and just enjoying life and not it just being this game of like, how can I look better? How can I get more money or, um, when I was in grad school or, or college or whatever, like get better grades to be liked or whatever. It was just really coming from this more authentic place. And, um, it was a few months after that, that I met my husband. Of course I had a couple setback relationships in that time, but I was able to bounce back much quicker. And while rejection always hurt and will always, always will hurt because we're not robots. We are humans with emotions. Um, the difference was that I could experience dating from just a place of this 
just not being anxiously attached to everything that may or may not happen because yes, rejection hurt, but I wasn't winding up my um, worthiness with it. And that made all the difference. So that's a long story. That's basically how I got to <laughs> my, uh, the relationship that I'm still in, still am in today. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so many great little takeaways from your story. So I just want to kind of recap for, for our listeners because so many who listen are getting their value from external sources, whether it's food or your Instagram likes or any, any other way that we create our worth through anything but ourselves. And it's really hard. I mean, it's not, it's not a, a, something that we do naturally, I think, especially depending on how you were brought up. You know, the, when you describe the getting your value from if you're thin, you're worthy. If you're not, you know, then, then there's something not worthy. I had a very close friend who all of the, the women in her family were overweight, like obese, overweight. And the mother, the first thing she would say about people was they're thin or they're not. It was the first thing she would notice because that was such a focus in the family. Yeah. So I get that. And my mother was always dieting. I luckily did not come out that way because I was naturally very thin and didn't think about it. And I think a lot of what I did was try to be the opposite of what I was experiencing in my home, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I still got my value from external sources, you know, and so we can do it in many different ways. And I think once you, the, the way you describe getting pleasure from food is such a big thing. I think for people who are dieters, who have such poor self, uh, who have self-loathing around their body, knowing that food can be seen as pleasure, that we actually, as women in particular, often take away pleasure from ourselves, that we are, I, I, you know, diet to me, the whole diet culture is about restriction and punishment. It's like yeah. the, the focus is restriction and you need to eat less and you need to do this. And the fact that you were counting calories and uh, uh, <laughs> it's yeah. just, uh, yeah. so, you know, just having a healthy approach to I'm eating and I'm, it's bringing me joy. This is a gift to my body. It's a major mindset shift. And so, you know, just beginning that process of that consciousness of, I can actually bring myself pleasure and joy is such a beautiful mindset to go into love with and that love should be fun. It should be feeling nourishing. It should feel like pleasure it's very parallel. That's why I say I accidentally healed um, because yeah, my, my love life sucked. <laughs> I was not where I wanted it to be by any stretch, but I had no concept of like, Hey, maybe you should do some inner work around your love life rather than trying to like edit your profile for the 10 millionth time. Mm -hmm. um, like that was just like, not even an idea that ever crossed my mind. Um, and you're right. Like diet culture is all about restriction and also mainstream dating advice is also about restriction and not pleasure, right? It's like, don't text too much, or don't say this, or don't be too much. Don't let him know how successful you are, how much money you have. You might intimidate. Don't share how you feel because that's going to scare him away. And so it's, it's still like this idea of restriction. And when you're not getting your needs met, when you're not sharing how you feel, when you're not able to connect with somebody because you're not sharing how you feel or who you really are, then you're not going to feel pleasure. <laughs> It's really true. So it's, it's very parallel to, <laughs> to diet culture and it's crazy. And, um, and so looking back, it makes perfect sense that I accidentally healed my love life through my relationship with food and body. But at the time, like, you know, there were two totally separate worlds that in my mind had nothing to do with each other, which obviously is not true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if so much is interconnected. I, yeah. I, I was helping a client with her love life and suddenly her assistant um, she runs her own business, her assistant quit. So we changed our focus to, you can't focus on love until you find an assistant and finding an assistant was about creating a must-have list and a deal breaker list and knowing how to vet and ask the right questions and not trust <laughs> without building trust. And so it's, it's all part of the same thing. If we do yeah. whatever we do in one area of our life starts to really spiral out into the other areas in a good way. 
Yeah. Um, and, and you just mentioned, you know, some of the dating advice, which I also really dislike. Uh, I think it's, it's makes, it's very shaming. And one of the things that we do in our group and our Facebook group is to really clarify what, what it means when women come with these uh, ideas about men have to always chase and you have to be passive and wait for men to do everything. It's like, makes me crazy. So there's, there's a way to look at all of this in a way that, that works for you as an individual. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Music Unlimited. You can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations. Plus, you can now stream your favorite podcasts like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere, on any of your devices, your smartphone, your tablet, your PC or Mac, Fire TV, and any Alexa-enabled devices like the Amazon Echo. Get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 30 days. Just head on over to getamazonmusic.com forward slash last first date to learn more and claim this offer. You mentioned the law of attraction, which is a big trigger for me too. So I, you say <laughs> that it can be harmful to people who are seeking love. And I'd love for you to just explain what you mean by that. Yeah. So the law of attraction, um, it's, I think the, the main problem with it is there's a lot of different angles to go about it, but I'll just start with the main thing I think is that the people who teach it or preach it or talk about it, treat it as if it were as true as something like the law of gravity. And you might just say, oh, that's just semantics, like whatever, it doesn't matter. But I think it actually matters because if you're like walking around one day, just walking down your street and all of a sudden you start floating out of nowhere, you're going to be like, what's going on here? Like, why is gravity working for everyone else? But me, something must be wrong with me. And that's probably not a bad question to ask if gravity seems to be working for everyone else, but you, Do you know what I mean? And so when the law of attraction is taught in very much the same way, it's like, like attracts like, and so you have to have good vibes or positive energy or good energy or whatever you call it. Um, and it's taught in this way that is as true as something like the law of gravity when it doesn't work, what do you do? Oh, something's wrong with me. I'm not doing it right. And that can feed into women's insecurities that were already fed with enough is something's wrong with you. You're not doing it right. You're not doing it enough. You have to try harder. You have to be better. You have to whatever. So I think that's the big reason because, you know, if the law of attraction quote unquote works for you, then like you love it. <laughs> but if it, if it doesn't, it can be deeply shaming and it can just really perpetuate you know, whatever cycle or, or thought pattern, um, that you might already be finding yourself in. The other thing that it does is that it really ostracizes very genuine, real human emotions. And the human emotions I'm referring to here are grief and anger. Um, obviously there's like nuances and there's lots of different ways to be angry or experience, um, grief or sadness. Um, but that, those are human emotions. And until you are either a robot or God, you as a human have to experience the full range of human emotions. Now I understand some human emotions are more desirable to feel more often things like joy and peace and calm. I get that. Like we want to feel like that most of the time, but that's, we just can't. Cause that's just not what's the deal that we got by being a human. Um, we learn through contrast, first of all. So we know what happiness is because we know what sadness is. And also um, sadness, anger, grief, those big three difficult emotions, they're, um, they're alchemical. They have the power to transform and heal. I mean, if you think of like everything from the American revolution up to present day, like BLM and everything, like every political movement in between, regardless of like your opinions or what side or whatever you're on, all of those um, revolutions, protest movements, they came from anger. <laughs> they didn't come because everyone was like, everything is great. So let's just go have a protest, right? And those protests catalyzed huge changes in our world and society. And the same thing can happen on, an, on a personal level as well. So if you were you know, let's say in a pretty toxic relationship and you're trying to, and you're trying to use the law of attraction so that you don't attract that again, you might actually feel a lot of freaking anger about how you were treated towards your ex. But if you don't want to go there because it's quote unquote bad or bad vibes or low vibes or whatever, 
then what you're doing is you're, is well, one, you're suppressing your emotions, but when, what you're not giving yourself the opportunity to do is when you experience the anger, then you get, you give yourself the opportunity to be like the way that that person treat me, treated me was messed up and it wasn't right. Right. And then from there, you're giving yourself so much opportunity to heal versus if you're like, I'm just going to say positive. I'm just going to not ignore the red flags next time. I'm going to stay positive, high vibes or whatever. You're not giving yourself that opportunity to heal. And you're just going to probably, um, you're well, not probably you're overwhelmingly likely to attract a very similar kind of relationship again, because I mean, there's lots of reasons for that, which we can get into, but one of them just being that it's familiar and it's comfortable. And sometimes when things feel familiar and comfortable, we can mistake them for, for love. If there's any unresolved hurt, we're going to try to resolve that out in a, um, in a relationship. And so all, all of these reasons are reasons why you might attract that same kind of relationship again, um, by denying yourself the opportunity to heal, um, because it requires quote unquote, bad, I'm putting that in air quotes for the audio listeners, bad emotions. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, the other reason is I think that the law of attraction favors people who are young, white, conventionally attractive and conventionally thin. Um, because if you are all of those things and you get on the apps, you're just going to have a different experience than someone who is older, uh, larger, not white, um, you know, not straight or, or whatever. And this is just, this is just like, we know this to be true because of the algorithms and the apps. Mm -hmm. Like this is just <laughs> how it works. You know what I mean? And it's not to say that, like, if you didn't fall into these dominant categories, you couldn't use the law of attraction tools or techniques if you wanted. Um, but I think it would be ludicrous to assume that you're going to have the same results as someone who's like 25, very thin, conventionally attractive, all of that kind of stuff. Like, it's just, it's just not going to get, you just not gonna have the same, same results. Um, and the last thing I'll say about it is, and I think this to be true of a lot of kind of toxic self-help things that self-help influencers have taken on is there's a nugget of truth, right? Like if you're um, just like really, really negative and always assume the worst is going to happen or to your, to you or whatever, I do think that you're setting yourself up for a lot of frustration and disappointment, not just in your love life, but probably just life in general. And, but I don't, I don't blame that to, or I don't chalk that up to the law of attraction. I think it's because if you're, if you're looking for the bad or you're assuming something bad's going to happen to you, you're all, this is probably gonna make you really stressed, really anxious. And when you're stressed and anxious, you're going to miss things. So you're going to make more mistakes. You also probably have horse blinders on and that, and, and, and when you're in that kind of mindset, so you're going to miss things outside of, you know, the horse, horse blinders. And also just like very practically, if you're stressed and anxious about your life and just, you know, not relating to it well, you're probably not going to sleep well. And then that creates more stress and anxiety, <laughs> more, more mistakes that you might make. Um, and so, yeah, I think that there are little nuggets of truth in most things that are taught, um, but they're not universal truths and they're not truths that apply hundred percent of the time. And I think that when a lot of people teach the law of attraction, they leave that part out. It's like, this is the end all be all. And it applies all the time, just like how the law of gravity is. And it's just not, it's, it's a spiritual practice. It's a spiritual way. Well, to some it's a spirit, the law of attraction is a spiritual way of being. Um, it's a belief around your relationship with the universe. And look, I'm not, I'm not the thought police. So if it works for you and you're listening and you want to run with it, go for it. But if it hasn't been working for you, or it sounds kind of weird to you, or you're wondering if you're being gaslit by some of the teachings of the law of attraction, then I encourage you to really look at it and see if it works for you. And maybe it works for you some of the time. And that's great. And then the other time you're like, you know what? I'm, I'm not dealing with law of attraction. I'm going to really lean into my anger around my ex so I can heal this, you know, stuff once and for all. There's a lot of, of shaming in the advice world. There's a lot of power over in the advice world. Uh, there's, there's people fall for gurus and, um, and deify them and don't really think for themselves. And it sounds like what you really stand for is feel your feelings, be true to you and find your authentic self in this process, because yeah. otherwise you're just kind of going along with a belief system that will probably make you feel worse about yourself 
than, than better. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I'm not saying everyone who teaches law of attraction does this, but I do think by nature it's manipulative and I know I've fallen for it. So I'm speaking as someone who's like, <laughs> I not like a huge victim, but a victim of it. Like, um, because I just fell for like the whole thing of like, well, you just have to show the universe that you really want this. And the way to show the universe, you really want this is to buy my program. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, maybe they didn't say that exactly, but that right. was message received and, you know, and it's, 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 um, <laughs> yeah. And if you don't get help by my program, then there's something wrong with you. Yeah. So, and I, yeah. you know, I put even in, in the first page or one of the first pages of my book, like I, like, it's so important to me. Like when people are listening to my, reading my book or my podcast or just consuming any content that I ever put out into the world. It's so important to me that people maintain their agency. Um, because well, one, I try to be, you know, in integrity as much as I possibly can, but also that truly, you know, can get in the way of your healing. If, if you're outsourcing like, Oh, this person knows everything. Or I, this person is like, whatever, like, you know, like DFI, like you, like you mentioned, then it really stunts your healing because you're probably just replacing that person with that person is just filling in whatever void or wound that, that you had. And so the first page of my book, I even say like, look, I'm sure in my story, I'm sure in some of my opinions and what I think and what I am from my perspective know to be true. Um, but that doesn't mean what exactly work for me is going to exactly work for you. Cause I'm my own self, my own experience and backgrounds as are you. And also if something really resonates that I share and you want to learn from it, and apply it in your life, like, great. And if something I say doesn't really resonate, like that's great too. You don't have to throw the baby with the, out with the bathwater, like feel free to be like, you know what? I love that Veronica said this. I don't agree with that or that doesn't resonate. So I'm just going to move on. I think that we just live in this world of like, it has to be all or nothing or, and then when it's the all, we tend to just like deify and put the person on the pedestal and it just ends up hurting both of us. Um, and I think the law of attraction is a big part of that problem. Let's talk about some other ways of healing. And you talk about inner child a lot in your book and that healing your inner child is really crucial to having lasting love. We've had people on the show before who talked about inner child healing. So can you touch on that, what it is and, and maybe even talk about some of your own experience with that? Inner child healing is basically healing the stories and beliefs um, that came about from difficult experiences as a child. So we can't change what happened, but we can change our relationship to it. And that's basically what inner child work is. So just to give a, this isn't necessarily a personal example, just a broad example is, um, let's say you had to walk on eggshells growing up because you didn't want to set off one of your parents' temper. Cause it was, it was scary. And so you just kind of walked on eggshells and you didn't really say what you were really, really feeling or thinking. You didn't really ask for much. You tried to be helpful so that you wouldn't set them off and maybe even get them to be happy or want to spend time with you. And that's what you just, you know, that's what you had to do when you were growing up and you know, you're five or you're eight or whatever. And you don't really have the option to be like, you know what, I'm going to get my own place. This doesn't really work for me. <laughs> you figure out what you can do to make it work. Right. And sometimes it really is truly about survival in extreme cases where there is, you know, violence or abuse or something like that. Um, and, and so while it was a completely normal and, um, I don't know if I want to say healthy, but normal thing to do as a child to survive or to make it through, or to just keep the peace or keep whatever. Um, when that same pattern transfers to an adult or to yourself as an adult, that's when, if the way in which you were relating, relating or getting that love or getting that love, uh, safety or belonging was in a less than healthy way, that's going to show up in your romantic relationship. So going back to the eggshell example, that might've made you maybe a people pleaser. Right. And so you just want to make sure everyone's really happy and that there aren't any confrontations and you're not going to really just say what you want or say what you need. You're just going to help everyone else because then if their needs are taken care of, then everything's in order, everything's safe. Mm -hmm. And again, you might've needed to do that for real when you were a child to you know, mitigate any tempers from your parents. Mm -hmm. um, but as an adult, that can lead to some pretty toxic 
unhealthy, even abusive relationships because your needs aren't getting met and it's the other person and their needs and their desires and all that kind of stuff um, that are important and taking priority in their relationship. And so what inner child work does is it goes back and you as the adult self connect with that little girl who developed that pattern of walking on eggshells. And you just reparent her and you give her the space to feel and to heal what she needs to feel and heal. And then you reparent her telling her what she needed or would have liked to hear or heard at the time. And so you develop this relationship with her, you know, in your own practice, you know, when you're doing your daily meditation or journalings or whatever. And then the important piece is to apply it because a lot of people understand why they do what they do or why they're in the patterns they're in, but they don't necessarily apply it. And so what you do is let's say you're feeling triggered in the relationship and, or just, you're not getting your needs met or just, you're just feeling something you don't want to be feeling basically while you're dating somebody. What you do is you, you have to ask yourself, okay, is this my adult self that is having this need? Or is this my inner child self that's calling the shots? And so if you're feeling like you just really want to make sure the other person is okay and is like happy and whatever, that's probably your inner child self calling the shots in that situation. If you're feeling a little dissatisfied in the relationship because you're not feeling heard or your needs aren't getting met or whatever, then that might be your adult self. And you can be like, okay, I actually need to have a conversation with this person because this isn't working for me. We need to create a boundary and agreement or whatever. But if you realize that it's your inner child self that's feeling triggered and, um, you know, needs to like feel reassured that the other person isn't mad or is okay or whatever, then that's on your side of the street to clean up, right? That's not the other person's job to reassure you for like the 10 millionth time or for you to like go and please them for the 10 millionth time or whatever. And so it helps you basically see what is your side of the street that you need to clean up so that you can show up in your healthiest, wholest self versus what is actually a need in the relationship that's not being met. And then you can have a conversation or leave the relationship potentially if the, it's not possible to have that need met or whatever. Um, but it just helps you figure out what you need to do so that you're not approaching situations from a triggered or reactive response because, well, on the surface, it's never going to go well, but a pattern of that in a relationship is very much likely a enmeshed codependent kind of relationship. I always say there's a yours, mine, and ours in every relationship. And a lot of times we take a my issue and then try to make it a their issue and it's not, or we make issue. their issue, our issue. Too. That's true too. <laughs> right. Anytime we're taking on what's not ours, it's, there's something wrong. And I, I love the, the, your side of the street kind of uh, way of looking at it because we often don't realize that we're making something into our side of the street or their side of the street when it doesn't belong there. And we all have core needs that need to be met both by ourselves and sometimes in relationship. And we have to know what the difference is and also how to express it. So I, I love this work. I think um, I've even had clients take a picture of themselves from when they were young and to reparent the inner child by giving her the love that she didn't get and the compassion, especially because we're so we're so mean to ourselves, you know, the, the mean, the mean part of ourselves that has beaten us up ourselves up for so long. Um, So let's, let's go to the final question. This is such an important conversation, Veronica. Um, And I appreciate all that you shared. What are your final words of advice for anyone who wants to go on their last first date? do whatever you want. And I know that sounds a little bit like a cop out, like, especially coming from a coach, like do it. What? Like you're supposed to tell me what to do. Like you're, you're, you're a coach. Right. And I think it's actually a pretty radical thing when you're thinking about it. Cause we talked about, you know, all of the dating advice, like do this, don't do that. You have to wait three hours. Don't text back or like have a second date too soon, or don't have sex until this date or whatever. Like there's all these rules and it's like, according to who, whose rules are these? Do they even work for you? Um, and so I really encourage people to do what you want. 
right? Like if you want to have sex the first night and freaking have sex the first night, if you want to wait till marriage, wait till marriage. If you want something in between, in between is fine. Um, if you want to share how you feel, if you want a second date, if you want to tell someone you like them, if you want someone to call you instead of text, freaking do it. Right. Because like all of these things that we just get so stressed and anxious and wound up about, if any of those things are the deal breaker or the thing that scares that person off, like they were never going to be available for the relationship you wanted anyways. Right. Cause that's not too much. And so I always just say, do what you want. And will that mean an immediate outcome of a possible rejection? Yeah, for sure. Like, you know, we're not trying to rejection proof anyone. We're trying to build rejection resilience, but, um, but when you do what you want and ask for what you want or ask for what you need or say how you feel or whatever, then you're going to get the information from this person that you need so much sooner rather than trying to like sit there for hours, trying to decide decipher, like the fa- what it meant that they put, that they didn't put an emoji or a smiley face or an exclamation point or whatever. Um, and you can just get the information and you'll either get what you want or you might get, yes, a temporary setback rejection, then you can move on much sooner and quicker because you haven't like wasted, you know, like what if you just found out two weeks in that someone is just really not going to be available for you rather than trying to dance around it for like months, if not years, just do what you want. Okay. Do what you want. (laughs) (laughs) Veronica, I know you have a, uh, an assessment on your website for people. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is and how they can find it? Yeah. So I created the emotional availability assessment, um, mostly because I was hearing from a lot of people coming to me and I'm sure this is true for you, Sandy, where women would be telling me, oh, men are so emotionally unavailable. How do you find the available ones or how do I make them available or whatever, you know, something along those lines. And obviously it's true that there are plenty of emotionally unavailable men. And there's the stereotypes that go along with it, you know, being aloof or non-committal or doesn't want to talk about emotions. Um, but the truth is, is that there's plenty of emotionally unavailable women. Um, but the stereotypes and the commonalities that go along with, with way, the way women often present as emotionally unavailable are not aloof. Doesn't want to talk about emotions. Um, it's not those things. And so we miss it in our, within ourselves. Um, and so I created this assessment, um, based on the 10 most common things that I see among my clients that actually make them emotionally unavailable, but they just may not realize that's making them emotionally unavailable. So, you know, some bound or some examples are not having boundaries, not asking for what you want or sharing how you feel, or assuming the other person should know how you feel or want, um, or, uh, like wanting to fix the other person or, you know, basically be their mom or their therapist or whatever, all of these things actually make you emotionally unavailable for the relationship that I think people listening to this podcast, um, and certainly my podcast want. So I created this assessment and it's like, you know, the Cosmo quizzes where you like give yourself a score, then you add it up all at the end. And, um, it's a score from a zero to a hundred and a hundred is like hundred percent emotionally available, but I give a pretty strong caveat (laughs) that like No one's a hundred percent emotionally available, nor do you need to be. Um, So I break it up into some categories um, and I say like around 80%, you're probably good. Um, Obviously it's subjective. So I encourage you to, you know, to either be super honest with yourself or maybe even, you know, have a friend do it with you. So that you're like, I don't know if that's really true. (laughs) Um, And that can give you the, the um, most accurate assessment. And then based on what your score is, you know, I've got resources, podcast episodes, you know, based on what comes up and, um, yeah, the assessment is available at veronicagrant.com forward slash assessment. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us, for sharing the lessons you learned that you now teach and really giving people permission to tune into themselves, because I think that's the overarching message is that you really have the wisdom within that we just need to take all the garbage away to find it and stop just listening blindly to what other people have been saying that may not at all work for you. So thank you, Veronica. My pleasure. And thank you so much for having me. And thanks everybody for listening. If you love our show, please rate and review us. Give us a five-star review on, on Apple Podcasts. And as always, here's to your last first date. If you are ready to get unstuck, 
gain new tools, become more empowered, and finally find your last first date, I'd love to talk to you. Fill out an application to be considered for a complimentary half-hour love breakthrough session at lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. That's lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. I look forward to talking to you soon.